speaker is Richard Stutman, who in his uh, short abstract uh, promised us a somewhat eccentric survey uh, to, uh, on algebraic and combinatorial structures intrinsic to functional programming. So, please start. Yeah, thank you. Um, uh, so, as a result of some of the really useful remarks of the referees, I'm going to uh, concentrate on just one aspect of this, uh, on, on the groups. Um, and uh, there's a long list of references in the extended abstract, so I won't, I won't present references in this talk. Um, the picture here, of course, is uh, uh, Bosch's uh, Vagabond Son. Uh, but I want to talk about, among other things, the son of the vagabond group. So this is the usual presentation of lambda calculus, which we've all seen numbers of times already in this conference. Um, the main thing I want to emphasize here is that eta will be used throughout. It's rather important if one wants to talk about even, even models. So we have, we will have eta almost all of the time. And of course, here we have combinators. Uh, and the particular selection of combinators I've used are actually churches, BCKIW. Uh, and of course, for equivalence, we need strong reduction and the combinatory axioms that are due to Hendley. Uh, um, now, uh, way back in it's got to be in the 1930s, Church observed that uh, lambda calculus forms a monoid uh, with a product equal B, the B combinator, and the identity, the usual identity, um, and if we're interested only in the combinatory version, we have to add enough axioms uh, for, uh, for eta conversion, really, um, to make a monoid plus We have the following axioms for B. Written this way, they're sort of incomprehensible. But written this way, where B is thought of as the product in the monoid, so B distributes over product. And we have this interesting axiom about how B commutes um, with B itself. Now, another way of looking at this last axiom is remember that since B can be distributed, it can be distributed in the other direction. So one way of thinking of this is if I have a stack of Bs uh, preceded by another stack of Bs, which is shorter, then I can commute them this way by increasing the second stack by one. It turns out that these axioms are precisely the axioms you need in order to generate a normal form which shows that if we look at the monoid generated by B and I alone, just duplicative combinations of B and I, using those axioms, we can put things in a normal form, and we can prove that that monoid itself, I'll go, I'll go one step in advance. We can prove, and I'll say why in a minute, that it's a constant cancellation monoid, okay? And um, can, it generates then a group. And that group turns out to be exactly Richard Thompson's group F, one of the so-called vagab three vagabond groups. They were discovered by Thompson in 1962 in connection with trying to prove um, some uh, some theorems about groups and the decidability of the word problem groups that was really generated in that respect to prove the undecidability of the word problem groups and has no apparent uh, connection with lambda calculus at all. Now, what is Thompson's group? Well, I'll give a nice description of the group later. Um, let me remark that the uh, reference to Cannon, Floyd, and I think, well, I don't know the third author. Cannon and Floyd is a very, very good survey article on Thompson's groups. 
uh, and even there, they, they go to some lengths to present uh, group F in a very complicated manner. We'll see this a much simpler representation later. At any rate, the easiest way to understand it is simply to give it as an infinitely generated group okay, um, that satisfies this axiom or this collection of axioms, which say that uh, you get the n plus first generator from by conjugating the nth generator by any of the generators k less than n. Okay, and this holds for all k less than n, and that's where the axioms come in. So it's not simply a definition of it. N plus first generator it says all, all of these are equal. That's Thompson's group. So that's the group one. It comes up in a very funny way in the DI monoid, this very small fragment of uh, uh, lambda calculus model. Now, here, so here we talk the BI monoid generates F. So a little description of how that works. So B, B to, these are subscripts. Those are su um, the superscripts, subscripts. Yes, I apologize for the way I write slides. I know they're, I'm sort of a dinosaur with respect to creating slides and, and uh, these, these are the kind of slides you would have created 30 years ago. I would have created 30 years ago. I'm not very good with tech. I didn't want to try that. So here's uh, B0 and Bn plus one is simply applying B and um, the subscripts are simply composing B with itself many times. And it's very easy to write out what the normal forms you get are. Because after all, it's a well-known fact that um, if you take the uh, applicative combinations of B and I, they're all normalizable. They all have types, for them, simple types. Uh, they all give you proper combinators. That is, all the lambdas are up front. And what you get is every tree with the variables at the leaves in exactly the right order. So that's, that's exactly what you get. Um, and so it's very easy to see what these would be. Now, our axioms before then show us we can put these in the following form. Okay, that is a stack like this, and N1, N2, so on down to NK, where the uh, um, superscripts here are in non-increasing order. There are many combinatorial ways of describing what's going on here, but just write it that way. And indeed, that it's, it follows almost immediately that the, uh, that you get the um, homomorphism from from F into uh, the bi monoid. Now it was well known that that F is simple, so we're really done. But we don't need that since it's a cancellation, a cancellation monoid, so it generates the group. In fact, that would be a proof that it's a cancellation monoid. But at the time I I did this. 40 years ago, um, I didn't know about F, and so I had to go out and prove it. Okay. So, so, sorry, could you just go back one slide? J yes. Just back to the previous slide. So, and just to check, I mean, here, the star is the star, is, is what you defined before for the, yes. the BI Yes, star is B. And I write it this way because B is associative, which yeah. you have to write it. Okay, so that's, yeah, that's a remarkable, remember that was, that offhand remark at the beginning of several slides ago was use enough ADA to make sure you have a monoid. Okay, so B, yes. B, when used this way, is in fact associated. Um, so I wrote it this way yes. as a monoid. Yeah. And you, and you, said, you said that you, this builds a homomorphism from, from what to what? Yeah. Uh, this establishes the fact that you can take uh, the F the group F in the generators, just be careful, okay, move the inverse from one side to the other so it's a monoid of the which is the group, okay? And then we, we just showed that those axioms can be realized here. Okay. Um, and that establishes only a homomorphism from F onto the VL monoid. What is the, uh, what do you map the generator G of N? What, how do you ah, interpret that generator? Yeah, um, yeah. Don't I say that? Oh, yes, I'm sorry, that's the next slide. Yeah, G of N is B to the N. 
Uh, okay. okay. That's and that's the infinite, infinitely. F can be generated is, is finitely generated. It has to be generated by two generators. That's not the, uh, But I use the infinite number of generators because it's just easier to grasp the axioms. Because the axioms are pretty straight. And you can see that if, if we go back here to these axioms, if you put that mm -hmm. over here, okay, and make it a monoid equation, and that's what we have here. Essentially, if you could stick, you can put a stack of these on top of both, a stack of these here and a stack of these there by this equation. And so that's essentially it. Okay, okay, thank you. Ah, okay, so that's group one. That's, um, uh, so the group F is generated by the I model. It is not the group of the model, the group of the model itself. Is now, yeah, I'm going to use that terminology again and again. If you have a monoid, then there is a set of convertible elements. That is elements that have right and left inverses. And of course, if they have right and left inverses, they must be the same. Uh, and that's called the group of the monoid. Now, that group, for a lot of monoids, for most monoids, I guess, uh, that, that group is trivial, it's just the identity. But in, in cases that we're going to be talking about, it's much bigger. So we'll be talking about the group of the model. Now, let me talk about one of my favorite subjects, surjective parent. Okay, so Church started this off with the delta function, but it only was for, yeah, a little history of this projective pairing, if you bear with me, um, was only for uh, beta normal forms. And Yandelam Klopp showed that surjective pairing, yeah, here it is, pairing, surjective. It's not Church Rosser. Will de Vrier show that it's consistent? If you're interested in this extension of the lambda calculus, very, I mean, it, it's the paradigm extension with a non lift linear rule. Let's put it that way. Um, a very nice, although much later than this, a very nice um, survey paper was stolen in 2006. I really like that paper. So I'm excited here. What does that have to do? Ah, what does that have to do with what we're talking about? Well, surjective pairing is part, part of the substantial of the number of calculus. Now, I would let me introduce the notion of Cartesian monoids. There are more, more monoids that correspond to surjective pairing. So there, what we're going to do is we're just going to take a surjective pairing at the usual axioms. Think of them as first order axioms. Think of a model of these first order axioms, and now think of lifting surjective pairing for functions in this way, clockwise. So, pair of two functions is it is the pointwise, pair. and they satisfy these axioms. These are not surprising. And you get one extra thing, and that is that composition distributes over pairing. And now, if we put this in the lambda calculus using eta, we get exactly the same answer. B, except here's B, and we're using eta all the time. Interestingly enough, um, this is a fragment of Bacchus's F2. Um, so we have another connection. Now, now Bacchus's FP does not contain lambda factors, but it contains enough axioms. In fact, it contains at least all of these. So here we have another connection to functional programming which does not go through the other So I personally uh, started talking about um, um, Cartesian models in, in 1996. It's not my idea, Cartesian models. On Landek and Scott, it's terminology, but the long list of references in the extended aspect. Now then, let us, uh, so, yeah, so here you go. Here's a first order theory. Get that for a minute. Here are the axioms over a mon over the enough axioms for a monoid. I is an identity of a monoid, associative uh, binary operation of multiplication. 
and LR constants and a pairing of a pair of a binary operation to be distributed. Okay, it's in the universal theory. There's a free model, it, um, free object models, free Cartesian model. So where am I going to go with this? Um, yeah, I'm going to show D that this monoid, of course, it has a group. And what is the group of this monoid? It turns out that the group of this monoid is another one of Thompson's groups, the biggest of Thompson's groups, the vagabond group itself, B. Kind of interesting. That means that B is part of lambda capitalist its rejected parent. So let me talk a little bit about that. So we have the pre Cartesian model. Um, talk a little bit about how things go. Uh, and the reason why I want to do this is because I'm going to get a, a very nice compact description of the elements in, in the group B. Um, and you'll want to compare that to the Canon Floyd representation that group theorists use. And you'll see, at least in my mind, that this is a much more perspicuous um, representation. So, all right, so we have a term. W is well written if it's a member of the sub on or generated by L and R. Okay, or that is a, it's a string of L's and R's multiplied together by its associative, so it's like this one. Or it's a pair of such ones. So it's an, here's an inductive definition. That's what I mean by well written. So, yeah, let me. I'm going to turn on the lights for a minute and I'll draw a picture. On my left here. Maybe I can this, right? So, what does a well written thing look like? Well, here's the string. Below it is a string. So, keep writing it. You have a binary tree. And the leaves of this tree are strings of nuts and bolts. Now, how do you multiply two of these together? By the distributive law, you take this and you put it up here. That's every possible place you can put it. And this string projects to the subtree that it wants to project, and you get something like something. I think that's almost perfect. That's what I wish for. I have to turn up the lights because it's nice. Okay, that's good. So that's what that's what these trees look like. Now, the one thing I should say about well-written well expressions is we've only used these axioms here. Uh, sorry, forget three. We've used one, two, and four. What about three? Now, three comes in at the end. Okay. Well-written expressions can be extracted, can be contracted and expanded by using these contractions, and that is. I have one of these. Looks like this. So these are this sort of pair. These are these. I've got a left over here and a right over here. And they're followed by exactly the same step. Same step. Then that's absolutely the same. Then I can contract that to this. Of course, I could reverse it, but it's wrong. Well, what is this? Why does this have to do with anything? Well, if you do a little bit of classical rewriting, you can see that 
two expressions in the theory of Cartesian monoids, two terms, two elements in the theory of Cartesian monoids are equal, if and only if they have a common, they can be reduced to a common normal form. That common normal form looks like one of these well written things. And the equivalence relation on well written expressions is simply this. It's sort of very really similar to uh, these are beta reductions, and this is, this is eta equivalence of beta normal terms. Really, that's what, uh, that's what's going on here. So, uh, so we have well written expressions. A well written expression can be thought of as a bar for each element. So just a well written expression. Moreover, W is unique modular expansions and contractions. That's what I just said. As I say, this is an elementary exercise in, in rewriting um, using those, those axioms. Ah, okay. Now, second fact. It's easy to prove that a well written expression W is a member of the group of the Cartesian model. Every line's got a group. If and only if w, w can be expanded and contracted or contracted to a well, a different well-written expression. Remember, they're all they're all equivalent. Such that tree of the new one, W prime has exactly two DVN leaves. It doesn't matter what the shape of the tree is, only that the number of leaves is two the one. And every string of L's and R's of that length n occurs. So what you have is you have a permutation of these strings stuck at the leaves. You could read it from left to right. The interesting thing is it has nothing to do with the shape of the tree but only the number of leaves. And every string should occur. Now we could think of the normal sequence of strings. Uh, you could view them as lexicographic. So what you have is some permutation of these strings at length n from the lexicographic order to some other. Ah, yeah, okay, so the intermezzo here is, uh, no, again, I say there's no restriction on the shape of the trees because f is somehow being hidden in the condition. The group f is in here and you can, you can change any one tree to any other tree. Another simple consequence of this is that the group has, has elements of infinite order. That's kind of easy to construct. You just think about the shapes of these things. The vagabond group is the most intuitively is, mo is most intuitively defined as a subgroup of homeomorphism group with care space, consistent of those uh, elements of, of those homeomorphisms that are step functions. Okay, so what we have is, I'll, I'll see what I mean. I have to put step functions in quotation because it's not, they're not exactly step functions. All right. So, Cantor space, the set of infinite binary sequences. Product topology, it's the Cantor space topology. It's very, very discrete kind of topology. Not exactly discrete, it's a totally disconnected house space. And the homeomorphism group of pairs, and I'll be more specific about what these, these things are. Um, when I say step functions, I don't literally mean that over intervals you get a, a constant. What I mean is that over intervals, they are one to one and onto a, a specific uh, other interval. That's pretty good. Let, let me be more specific. A map f from Cantor space to Cantor space is said to be piecewise a piece shift up. That's what I mean by these step functions. If, okay, so capital F here is a piecewise shift operator if. Give it an infinite sequence. F, look, F look, looks at that infinite sequence one bit at a time. Then it finally decides after seeing u bits. Okay, that it takes those u bits, cuts them off, and sticks on v, uh, another sequence called v. So it's a continuous operation on, on Cantor space. Once it's got enough information, okay, when it maps, the way it maps is it sh it's a shift. It cuts this off, and it shifts g, which is the end of this infinite sequence, 
phi b. Moreover, for any other h, it does the same thing. If it sees u, it shifts by u. So piecewise shift operators. And this condition here is why I call them step functions. And of course, they're only in their position. They're continuous. So these are all the piecewise shift operators. The piecewise shift operators that are bijectional, they are of course form precisely the group, uh, the vagabond group here. So here, F, G, and H are infinite binary sequences. Now, if we set the identity equal the identity, if we set left uh, is uh, shift by zero, right shift by a one. And now the pairing operation simply says, if I see a zero, give me the first coordinate, and apply F. If I see a one, give me the second coordinate, apply G. Composition, ah, composition. Well then, is in reversal of Now this, uh, under this definition, the set of piecewise shift operators form a Cartesian monoid. And the group of this Cartesian monoid is group. Okay. Uh, I guess that went on kind of fast, but Next group, all right. Uh, Ms. Uh, Marie Angelo, Angelo, stop this. This on his group. An intuitive description. Start with group G, consider sequences G, H of elements from G with finite support. Permutations P, Q of the natural numbers with finite support. And find the product is for Ah, what a copy. You all know. Um, about the hereditary permutations. So this is the abstract group that would go with the hereditary permutations. Yeah, so this is all described in Varga. There's a simpler, much simpler representation on trees, but I prefer today to stay with the hereditary permutations. The lambda term, the two-sided inverses are about the hereditary permutations. That is Mrs. Desani's theorem. Group of the lambda characters model. The entire monoid is originally described by Church. Under beta eta conversion, it is the design is design group. Hereditary permutation. Okay. Now, so we have two different groups. So we've got B and its subgroups. Oh, yes. I should mention before I go on, there is one other group. Oh, I think I'll talk about uh, yes, the other group, other part of the vagabond groups is T, the group in between F and um, P. And it, it would be interesting to find exactly any, if there's an interesting um, fragment of lemma capital that corresponds to, to T. Already, it's, look, if you look at the predatory permutations, they're all linear. Okay, so already in the linear lambda capitals, you have the uh, um, you have the full design the full design group for the three permutations are there already. So it's going to have to be less than linear, and I don't know exactly uh, where T comes up. Okay, now we have a different. So can I just ask a question? Yes. Go can I just ask a question? So, I mean, <clears throat> so I I mean just to to recap. So the group F is generated from the the BI monoid. Yes. And the the group V is generated by uh, is it the the extension of the BI monoid with surjective pairing? Ah, or, or? no. Um, it's not just generated. It is. Once we go up to surjective pairing, okay. Mm -hmm. uh, the the group V is the group of that monoid. In the case of F, F is not the group of that monoid. The group of that monoid is trivial, just the identity. You have to add the invert. Yes. So there's two separate okay. forces. But once you have V, of course, you have group F as a subgroup. 
Yeah, okay. That's, that, 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 that's, a, that's sort of a subtle difference, yeah. Yeah, there are things okay. versus the BI monoid. You just not, you could add them. It would do no harm. It doesn't have a good, in fact, I believe Corrado Bohm looked at something like that at some stage. Um, I would have to go back and look at some of the correspondence, but yeah, I, I think he actually thought about adding images. It certainly is not, not a classical thing. Okay, so here, so this group is familiar, the hereditary permutations. The group uh, from subjective pairing is not so clear. Uh, what's the connection between the two? Well, let me cite a, uh, uh, an observation of Jan Willem Klopp, which is quite easy to prove. Um, it's around 1980. I don't know exactly when. Finally generated subgroups of Grazani's group are finite. Fi um, there are no elements of infinite order. It's very easy to put in fact, like, you know, these hereditary permutations all have types and so on. It's an easy exercise. Um, now, of course, as I pointed out before, there are elements uh, of infinite order in the vagabond group. Therefore, the vagabond group cannot be isomorphically embedded into the Zonis group. Now, both of these groups are subgroups of the group of the monoid of eta eta plus surjective pairing, that is lambda countless with surjective pairing. So that group is really much bigger. Or you say, but wait a minute, maybe, maybe the Zonis group is isomorphically embedded into B, ah, interesting question. What is this group? B cannot be embedded into the Zonis group. Open problem. What is the group of lambda, beta, eta plus subjective pairing? And let me add, um, I can't prove that you can't embed the Zonis group into B. I conjecture you can. There is something of the there's a parity consideration. Just I can describe. I can't get. I can't embed it, and I, because of the way that direct limit goes. That's the easiest way to describe. Yeah, intuitively, it's something like this. Uh, you're, you're, when you do composition of hereditary permutations, you're doing uh, an alternation of right and left um, actions, group actions. And you are always flipping sides in order so that the composition works well. So there's a, a, a flipping of sides, which can't be done in the animal. Uh, that's probably not, that's probably incomprehensible. But question, um, prove, uh, prove my conjecture that um, the Zonis group, the group of hereditary permutations, cannot be isomorph isomorphically embedded into the Vagabond group. And Oh, big open problem. What is give a characterization of the group of lambda beta eta plus trajectory? I think I probably spoke too quickly. Oh. Any questions? Yeah. <laughs> so I wanted to ask whether there are any questions or comments. And you were exactly on time. I finished exactly on time. And thanks for giving another open program. I have a few questions. Uh, one is about another open problem. Sorry? Uh, which you mentioned in the references that you gave in your abstract for an old technical report of yours, Combinators and the Theory of Partitions. Yes. Ah, yeah. yeah. Uh, so, so you you looked at uh, some problems associated to the BI monoid. And at the end of the paper, you, so at the end of the, so you proved the theorem that unification is undecidable. Yes. But you said that you leave the decision problem for monoid equations open. And wh what did you mean by that? And is it still an open problem? If you, <laughs> this was a, uh, from 1988, so maybe it's a bit unfair to ask this question. But. Do well, the, the uh, 
Uh, I don't have to look back. I guess it's probably I didn't know what the complexity is. Notice that I've been, uh, I, haven't, I have not mentioned uh, oh. Ah, yes. Well, there was another slide. I'll get to that in a second. Yeah, I, I have studiously avoided uh, um, okay. uh, asking, uh, talking about the complexity of any of these uh, decision problems. I know some. And yes, good yes, okay. That's what I thought. I, I think I don't know the answer to that. It may very well be that it's not hard. Uh, but what is the complexity of that if I get into these things? Um, yeah, I thought. Yeah, actually, uh, th that I thought that was. I think what you that may have been mentioned. settled. Uh, yeah, I think I know the answer. Actually, I think that was settled by Berger. By by whom? B i r. I think I'm pronouncing it correctly. Berger. B i r. And I think the reference should be. Um, reference should be in the extended abstract. And if it's not, it was an oversight. Um, I think it's. Yeah, I think it's. Call it on your time. Mm -hmm. I think what has to do is change the representation. You get call it on your time. Argument. But yeah, let me add. Yeah, yeah there was a, an, uh, an afterthought. There, um, there is a sort of application to group theory, which I thought was kind of interesting. Uh, recently, you were, well, I would call it an application. I don't know if group theory is called an application. But you do what you can, sort of. Uh, recently, we were able to use the Cartesian model of representation to really show that the following problem. Uh, is decidable. You give me a finitely generated subgroup of B, and then a membership problem for finitely generated subgroup. So you give me a finite number of elements of V and another element. Is this is the other element in the subgroup generated by the first set? And um, the Cartesian model representation of V shows you that problem is in fact a decidable problem. Problems of this sort are usually not. Um, and I don't think that follows easily from anything that's known about you. Mm -hmm. So I think that's that was my guess. Yes. Okay. Okay. Are there no you want you want to ask some more questions? I, I have some more questions, but I, I mean um I mean, I'm, I'm interested in all, all of these groups. I mean, even so the, the first the the BI monoid generating the the group f so you know b these the combinators b and i are related to planar lambda calculus that uh, that alex talked about yesterday also kasha talked about uh, but one so i mean whereas the b b c and i the, that combinator basis generates all of the linear terms. B and I do not generate all of the planar terms. And uh, they, so some monoid, some larger monoid that somehow contains all of the planar terms, where by planar I mean uh, terms where the variables are used in order. Uh, good question. Good question. Um, It's a very vague, vague question, but yeah, yeah it, it seems to be uh, he's, he jumps at it, he jumps between these fragments of people. Um, okay, so it's kind of an another open problem, or. <laughs> Okay, thanks. Are there any other comments or questions? We still have like two minutes uh, before switching to another talk. Uh, yes, uh, this morning, uh, the, uh, we, we were presented an open problem on, uh, on what, what was called the whole property for B. And uh, I ask whether this, uh, the, this uh, uh, property uh, has to do with uh, with another uh, uh, you know could be presented another way 
And it seems to me that it is somewhat connected with the uh, with the problem of the, those groups generated uh, by B. Uh, so uh, it, it's not clear, uh, but it's some some question for the audience, not uh, not for the speaker. But but uh, to 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 look at the connection between the the problem presented, the open problem presented this morning, and. Uh, the, the talk of uh, Rick Patman this afternoon. What yeah, do you I think, that, Noah, up you, up. you may have the idea. <laughs> no, to, to, to follow up, I, I just, I, post, there, I posted a link to Nakano's slides from the Open Problem session. Yeah. I mean, maybe, uh, and I mean, he has this decomposition. I mean, he was using this decomposition, so I mean, it is, it is related. I think his his question to ah, yes. to these these kinds of questions. Mm. Okay, thank you. Okay, thanks for this oh, uh, the, comment. The, the, yeah, the, I could. Yeah, the congregatory medium of this representation is something like this. Um, we build up a uh, we build up a binary tree by starting from a carrot. That's what. Panels like club, club, just a branch. These are these are binary trees. There, there's no line in the near So, uh, and then to get the next tree, you add a carrot sum. And that's basically what these operations are doing. They're generating. So these are all proper combinations we have, where, where the variables just are listed in their numerical order from left to right across the top of the tree. And we're just sticking another carrot up there. That's what we're doing. That's all this thing does. This is delayed, delayed um, composition, which is just simply sticking a carrot where it was before. And uh, um, there was a single root, you're splitting it into two. So that's the common to meaning of this normal form. It just it, all it says is that you can build up every binary tree there. That's all it says. Algebraically, it corresponds to M. See what I mean? Yeah. Oh. So all it says is that you can every binary yes. So, but of course, that's what and that's the last that's the last one, but of course you're gonna do it in some shapes of complex. That's the common form meaning of the common form. So common form doesn't mean that one. Okay. Yeah. Okay, thank you. I think we have to stop at this point. So thanks. Let us all thank the speaker. And of course, uh, we can discuss it in Discord. And now we turn to the uh, last slide in this session. And uh, in 